Muhi ud din Muhammad Persian, Mi al din Mehmd Hindi, Abula Muzaffara Mahiuddin Muhammad Aurangaziba Alamajara, the 3rd of November 1618 to the 3rd of March 1707, commonly known by the sobriquet Aurangzeb Urdu, Aurangzeb Persian, ornament of the throne, or by his regnal title Alamgir Urdu, Almgir Persian, Alm conqueror of the world, was the sixth Mughal emperor. Widely considered the last effective Mughal emperor, his reign lasted for 49 years from 1658 until his death in 1707. Aurangzeb was a notable expansionist during his reign, and the Mughal Empire reached its greatest extent, ruling over nearly all of the Indian subcontinent. During his lifetime, victories in the south expanded the Mughal Empire to 4 million square kilometers, and he ruled over a population estimated to be over 158 million subjects, with an annual yearly revenue of $450 million more than ten times that of his contemporary Louis XIV of France, or £38,624,680 in 1690. Under his reign, the Mughal Empire surpassed China to become the world's largest economy, worth over $90 billion, nearly a quarter of world GDP in 1700. Aurangzeb has been subject to controversy and criticism for his policies that abandoned his predecessor's legacy of pluralism and religious tolerance, citing his introduction of the jizya tax, destruction of Hindu temples, and the executions of Maratha kingdom ruler Sambhaji and the ninth Sikh guru, Guru Teg Bahadur. Various historians question the historicity of the claims of his critics, arguing that his destruction of temples has been exaggerated, and noting that he also built temples, paid for the maintenance of temples, employed significantly more Hindus in his imperial bureaucracy than his predecessors did, and opposed bigotry against Hindus and Shia Muslims. The downfall of the Mughal Empire began near the end of his reign due to his political and religious intolerance. Early life Aurangzeb was born on 3 November 1618, in Dahad, Gujarat. He was the third son and sixth child of Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal. In June 1626, after an unsuccessful rebellion by his father, Aurangzeb and his brother Dara Shuko were kept as hostages under their grandparents Nur Jahan and Jahangir Lahore court. On 26 February 1628, Shah Jahan was officially declared the Mughal Emperor, and Aurangzeb returned to live with his parents at Agra Fort, where Aurangzeb received his formal education in Arabic and Persian. His daily allowance was fixed at Rs. 500, which he spent on religious education and the study of history. On 28 May 1633, Aurangzeb escaped death when a powerful war elephant stampeded through the Mughal imperial encampment. He rode against the elephant and struck its trunk with a lance, and successfully defended himself from being crushed. Aurangzeb's valor was appreciated by his father who conferred him the title of Bahadur brave and had him weighed in gold and presented gifts worth 200,000 rupees. This event was celebrated in Persian and Urdu verses, and Aurangzeb said, If the elephant fight had ended fatally for me, it would not have been a matter of shame. Death drops the curtain even on emperors, it is no dishonor. The shame lay in what my brothers did. <inaudible> Early military campaigns and administration <inaudible> Bundela War Aurangzeb was nominally in charge of the force sent to Bundelkhand with the intent of subduing the rebellious ruler of Orcha, Jujar Singh, who had attacked another territory in defiance of Shah Jahan's policy and was refusing to atone for his actions. By arrangement, Aurangzeb stayed in the rear, away from the fighting, and took the advice of his generals as the Mughal army gathered and commenced the siege of Orcha in 1635. The campaign was successful and Singh was removed from power. Topic. Viceroy of the Deccan Aurangzeb was appointed Viceroy of the Deccan in 1636. After Shah Jahan's vassals had been devastated by the alarming expansion of Ahmednagar during the reign of the Nizam Shahi boy Prince Mortaza Shah III, the emperor dispatched Aurangzeb, who in 1636 brought the Nizam Shahi dynasty to an end. 
In 1637, Aurangzeb married the Safavid princess Dilraz Banu Begum, posthumously known as Rabia Ud Durrani. She was his first wife and chief consort as well as his favorite. He also had an infatuation with a slave girl, Hira Bai, whose death at a young age greatly affected him. In his old age, he was under the charms of his concubine, Udaipuri Bai. The latter had formerly been a companion to Dara Shuko. In the same year, 1637, Aurangzeb was placed in charge of annexing the small Rajput kingdom of Baglana, which he did with ease. In 1644, Aurangzeb's sister, Jahanara, was burned when the chemicals in her perfume were ignited by a nearby lamp while in Agra. This event precipitated a family crisis with political consequences. Aurangzeb suffered his father's displeasure by not returning to Agra immediately but rather three weeks later. Shah Jahan had been nursing Jahanara back to health in that time and thousands of vassals had arrived in Agra to pay their respects. Shah Jahan was outraged to see Aurangzeb enter the interior palace compound in military attire and immediately dismissed him from his position of viceroy of the Deccan. Aurangzeb was also no longer allowed to use red tents or to associate himself with the official military standard of the Mughal emperor. Other sources tell us that Aurangzeb was dismissed from his position because Aurangzeb left the life of luxury and became a fakir. In 1645, he was barred from the court for seven months and mentioned his grief to fellow Mughal commanders. Thereafter, Shah Jahan appointed him governor of Gujarat where he served well and was rewarded for bringing stability. In 1647, Shah Jahan moved Aurangzeb from Gujarat to be governor of Balkh, replacing a younger son, Murad Bash, who had proved ineffective there. The area was under attack from Uzbek and Turkmen tribes. While the Mughal artillery and muskets were a formidable force, so too were the skirmishing skills of their opponents. The two sides were in stalemate and Aurangzeb discovered that his army could not live off the land, which was devastated by war. With the onset of winter, he and his father had to make a largely unsatisfactory deal with the Uzbeks, giving away territory in exchange for nominal recognition of Mughal sovereignty. The Mughal force suffered still further with attacks by Uzbeks and other tribesmen as it retreated through the snow to Kabul. By the end of this two-year campaign, into which Aurangzeb had been plunged at a late stage, a vast sum of money had been expended for little gain. Further inauspicious military involvements followed, as Aurangzeb was appointed governor of Multan and Sindh. His efforts in 1649 and 1652 to dislodge the Safavids at Kandahar, which they had recently retaken after a decade of Mughal control, both ended in failure as winter approached. The logistical problems of supplying an army at the extremity of the empire, combined with the poor quality of armaments and the intransigence of the opposition have been cited by John Richards as the reasons for failure, and a third attempt in 1653, led by Dara Shiko, met with the same outcome. Aurangzeb became viceroy of the Deccan again after he was replaced by Dara Shuko in the attempt to recapture Kandahar. Aurangzeb regretted this and harbored feelings that Shiko had manipulated the situation to serve his own ends. Aurangbad's two jaggers land grants were moved there as a consequence of his return and, because the Deccan was a relatively impoverished area, this caused him to lose out financially. So poor was the area that grants were required from Malwa and Gujarat in order to maintain the administration and the situation caused ill feeling between father and son. Shah Jahan insisted that things could be improved if Aurangzeb made efforts to develop cultivation. Aurangzeb appointed Murshid Kali Khan to extend to the Deccan the ZABT revenue system used in northern India. Murshid Kali Khan organized a survey of agricultural land and a tax assessment on what it produced. To increase revenue, Murshid Kali Khan granted loans for seed, livestock, and irrigation infrastructure. The Deccan returned to prosperity, but too slowly to satisfy the emperor. Aurangzeb proposed to resolve the situation by attacking the dynastic occupants of Golconda, the Qutb Shahis, and Bijapur, the Adil Shahis. As an adjunct to resolving the financial difficulties, the proposal would also extend Mughal influence by accruing more lands. Again, he was to feel that Dara had exerted influence on his father, believing that he was on the verge of victory in both instances. Aurangzeb was frustrated that Shah Jahan chose then to settle for negotiations with the opposing forces rather than pushing for complete victory. Topic: <laughs> War of Succession. The four sons of Shah Jahan all held governorships during their father's reign. The emperor favored the eldest, Dara Shuko. 
This had caused resentment among the younger three, who sought at various times to strengthen alliances between themselves and against Dara. There was no Mughal tradition of primogeniture, the systematic passing of rule, upon an emperor's death, to his eldest son. Instead it was customary for sons to overthrow their father and for brothers to war to the death among themselves. Historian Satish Chandra says that, "...in the ultimate resort, connections among the powerful military leaders, and military strength and capacity were the real arbiters." The contest for power was primarily between Dara Shiko and Aurangzeb because, although all four sons had demonstrated competence in their official roles, it was around these two that the supporting cast of officials and other influential people mostly circulated. There were ideological differences. Dara was an intellectual and a religious liberal in the mold of Akbar, while Aurangzeb was much more conservative. But, as historians Barbara D. Metcalf and Thomas R. Metcalf say, to focus on divergent philosophies neglects the fact that Dara was a poor general and leader. It also ignores the fact that factional lines in the succession dispute were not, by and large, shaped by ideology." Mark Gaboro, professor of Indian studies at l'école des hautes études and sciences sociales, explains that the loyalties of officials and their armed contingents seem to have been motivated more by their own interests, the closeness of the family relation and above all the charisma of the pretenders than by ideological divides." Muslims and Hindus did not divide along religious lines in their support for one pretender or the other nor, according to Chandra, is there much evidence to support the belief that Jahanara and other members of the royal family were split in their support. Jahanara, certainly, interceded at various times on behalf of all of the princes and was well regarded by Aurangzeb even though she shared the religious outlook of Dara. In 1656, a general under Qutb Shahi dynasty named Musa Khan led an army of 12,000 musketeers to attack Aurangzeb, and later on the same campaign, Aurangzeb, in turn, rode against an army consisting 8,000 horsemen and 20,000 Karnataka musketeers. Having made clear that he wanted Dara to succeed him, Shah Jahan became ill with strangulation. In 1657, and was closeted under the care of his favorite son in the newly built city of Shah Jahanabad, Old Delhi. Rumors of the death of Shah Jahan abounded, and the younger sons were concerned that Dara might be hiding it for Machiavellian reasons. Thus, they took action. Shah Shuja in Bengal, where he had been governor since 1637, Prince Muhammad Shuja crowned himself king at Rajmahal and brought his cavalry, artillery, and river flotilla upriver towards Agra. Near Varanasi his forces confronted a defending army sent from Delhi under the command of Prince Suleiman Shuko, son of Dara Shuko, and Raja Jai Singh while Murad did the same in his governorship of Gujarat and Aurangzeb did so in the Deccan. It is not known whether these preparations were made in the mistaken belief that the rumours of death were true or whether the challengers were just taking advantage of the situation. After regaining some of his health, Shah Jahan moved to Agra and Dara urged him to send forces to challenge Shah Shuja and Murad, who had declared themselves rulers in their respective territories. While Shah Shuja was defeated at Benares in February 1658, the army sent to deal with Murad discovered to their surprise that he and Aurangzeb had combined their forces, the two brothers having agreed to partition the empire once they had gained control of it. The two armies clashed at Dharmat in April 1658, with Aurangzeb being the victor. Shuja was being chased through Bihar and the victory of Aurangzeb proved this to be a poor decision by Dara Shiko, who now had a defeated force on one front and a successful force unnecessarily pre-occupied on another. Realizing that his recalled Bihar forces would not arrive at Agra in time to resist the emboldened Aurangzeb's advance, Dara scrambled to form alliances in order but found that Aurangzeb had already courted key potential candidates. When Dara's disparate, hastily concocted army clashed with Aurangzeb's well-disciplined, battle-hardened force at the Battle of Samugar in late May, neither Dara's men nor his generalship were any match for Aurangzeb. Dara had also become overconfident in his own abilities and, by ignoring advice not to lead in battle while his father was alive, he cemented the idea that he had usurped the throne. After the defeat of Dara, Shah Jahan was imprisoned in the fort of Agra where he spent eight long years under the care of his favorite daughter Jahanara. Aurangzeb then broke his arrangement with Murad Bash, which probably had been his intention all along. Instead of looking to partition the empire between himself and Murad, he had his brother arrested and imprisoned at Gwalior Fort. Murad was executed on 4 December 1661, ostensibly for the murder of the Dewan of Gujarat sometime earlier. 
The allegation was encouraged by Aurangzeb, who caused the Dewan's son to seek retribution for the death under the principles of Sharia law. Meanwhile, Dara gathered his forces, and moved to the Punjab. The army sent against Shuja was trapped in the east, its generals Jai Singh and Dalir Khan submitted to Aurangzeb, but Dara's son, Suleiman Shiko, escaped. Aurangzeb offered Shah Shuja the governorship of Bengal. This move had the effect of isolating Dara Shiko and causing more troops to defect to Aurangzeb. Shah Shuja, who had declared himself emperor in Bengal began to annex more territory and this prompted Aurangzeb to march from Punjab with a new and large army that fought during the Battle of Kajwa, where Shah Shuja and his chain mail armoured war elephants were routed by the forces loyal to Aurangzeb. Shah Shuja then fled to Arakan in present-day Burma, where he was executed by the local rulers, with Shuja and Murad disposed of, and with his father immured in Agra, Aurangzeb pursued Dara Shiko, chasing him across the northwestern bounds of the empire. Aurangzeb claimed that Dara was no longer a Muslim and accused him of poisoning the Mughal Grand Vizier Sadullah Khan. After a series of battles, defeats and retreats, Dara was betrayed by one of his generals, who arrested and bound him. In 1658, Aurangzeb arranged his formal coronation in Delhi. On 10 August 1659, Dara was executed on grounds of apostasy and his head was sent to Shah Jahan. Having secured his position, Aurangzeb confined his frail father at the Agra fort but did not mistreat him. Shah Jahan was cared for by Jahanara and died in 1666. Reign. Bureaucracy Aurangzeb's imperial bureaucracy employed significantly more Hindus than that of his predecessors. Between 1679 and 1707, the number of Hindu officials in the Mughal administration rose by half, many of them Marathas and Rajputs. His increasing employment of Hindus and Shia Muslims was deemed controversial at the time, with several of his fellow Sunni Muslim officials petitioning against it, which he rejected, and responded, "'What connection have earthly affairs with religion? And what right have administrative works to meddle with bigotry? For you is your religion and for me is mine.' He insisted on employment based on ability rather than religion. Under Aurangzeb's reign, Hindus rose to represent 31.6% of Mughal nobility, the highest in the Mughal era. This was largely due to a substantial influx of Marathas, who played a key role in his successful Deccan campaign. During his time, the number of Hindu Manzabdars increased from 22% to over 31% in the Mughal administration, as he needed them to continue his fight in the Deccan. However, one of his Rajput nobles, Jaswant Singh of Jodhpur, Hindu ruler of Jodhpur, destroyed mosques and built idol temples in their stead, around 1658-1659, according to Aurangzeb. Despite this, relationships did not turn sour between the two, as they worked together for the next two decades up until Singh's death in the late 1670s. Topic. Establishment of Islamic law Aurangzeb was an orthodox Muslim ruler. Subsequent to the policies of his three predecessors, he endeavored to make Islam a dominant force in his reign. However these efforts brought him into conflict with the forces that were opposed to this revival. Historian Catherine Brown has noted that the very name of Aurangzeb seems to act in the popular imagination as a signifier of politico-religious bigotry and repression, regardless of historical accuracy." The subject has also resonated in modern times with popularly accepted claims that he intended to destroy the Bamiyan Buddhas. As a political and religious conservative, Aurangzeb chose not to follow the secular religious viewpoints of his predecessors after his ascension. Shah Jahan had already moved away from the liberalism of Akbar, although in a token manner rather than with the intent of suppressing Hinduism, and Aurangzeb took the change still further. Though the approach to faith of Akbar, Jahangir and Shah Jahan was more syncretic than Babur, the founder of the empire, Aurangzeb's position is not so obvious. His emphasis on Sharia competed, or was directly in conflict, with his insistence that Zawabit or secular decrees could supersede Sharia. The chief Qazi refusing to crown him in 1659, Aurangzeb had a political need to present himself as a defender of the Sharia, due to popular opposition to his actions against his father and brothers. 
Despite claims of sweeping edicts and policies, contradictory accounts exist. Historian Catherine Brown has argued that Aurangzeb never imposed a complete ban on music. He sought to codify Hanafi law by the work of several hundred jurists, called fatawa e alamgiri it is possible the War of Succession and continued incursions combined with Shah Jahan's spending made cultural expenditure impossible. As emperor, Aurangzeb banned the drinking of alcohol, gambling, castration, servitude, eunuchs, music, nosh, and narcotics in the Mughal Empire. He learnt that at Sindh, Multan, Thatta, and particularly at Varanasi, the Hindu Brahmins attracted large numbers of indigenous local Muslims to their discourses. He ordered the subadars of these provinces to demolish the schools and the temples of non-Muslims. Aurangzeb also ordered subadars to punish Muslims who dressed like non-Muslims. The executions of the antinomian Sufi mystic Sarmad Kashani and the ninth Sikh guru Teg Bahadur bear testimony to Aurangzeb's religious policy. The former was beheaded on multiple accounts of heresy, the latter, according to Sikhs, because he objected to Aurangzeb's forced conversions. Topic. Taxation policy He imposed jizya, a military tax on non-Muslims who were not fighting for Mughal Empire in his second decade on ruling in the year 1679. Further, Aurangzeb levied discriminatory taxes on Hindu merchants at the rate of 5% as against 2.5% on Muslim merchants. He ordered to dismiss Hindu Kwanungos and Patwaris from revenue administration. The introduction of jizya in 1679 was a response to several events shortly before its introduction the Great Rajput Rebellion of 1678, the Maratha alliance with the Shia Golconda, and the Mughal expansion into the Deccan. However, according to Jamal Malik, the contemporary historian Kafi Khan died 1733, whose family had served Aurangzeb, noted that jizya could not be levied and remained largely a tax on paper only. <laughs> Policy on temples and mosques During his reign, Aurangzeb ordered the destruction of many temples and some mosques. For example, he ordered the destruction of Vishvanath Temple at Varanasi for being a center of conspiracy against the state, and he ordered the destruction of the Jama Masjid at Golkunda after finding out that its ruler had built the mosque in order to hide revenues from the state. Aurangzeb displayed a particular animus towards Hindus and their temples. In the first volume of his Pulitzer Prize winning book series, historian Will Durant stated the following Aurangzeb cared nothing for art, destroyed its heathen monuments with coarse bigotry, and fought, through a reign of half a century, to eradicate from India almost all religions but his own. He issued orders to the provincial governors, and to his other subordinates, to raise to the ground all the temples of either Hindus or Christians, to smash every idol, and to close every Hindu school. In one year, 1679-80, 66 temples were broken to pieces in Amber alone, 63 at Chittur, 123 at Udaipur, and over the site of a Banaras temple especially sacred to the Hindus he built, in deliberate insult, a Mohammedan mosque. He forbade all public worship of the Hindu faiths, and laid upon every unconverted Hindu a heavy capitation tax. As a result of his fanaticism, thousands of the temples which had represented or housed the art of India through a millennium were laid in ruins. We can never know, from looking at India today, what grandeur and beauty she once possessed. Aurangzeb converted a handful of timid Hindus to Islam, but he wrecked his dynasty and his country. A few Muslims worshipped him as a saint, but the mute and terrorized millions of India looked upon him as a monster, fled from his tax gatherers, and prayed for his death. During his reign the Mughal Empire in India reached its height, extending into the Deccan, but it was a power that had no foundation in the affection of the people, and was doomed to fall at the first hostile and vigorous touch. The emperor himself, in his last years, began to realize that by the very narrowness of his piety he had destroyed the heritage of his fathers. Aurangzeb changed the name of one of Hinduism's holiest cities, Benares, to Muhammadabad. Among the Hindu temples he demolished were three of the most sacred, the Kashi Visvanath Temple, Kasava Deo Temple, and Somnath Temple, and built large mosques in their place. In 1679, he ordered destruction of several prominent temples that had become associated with his enemies, including those of Khandela, Udaipur, Chittor and Jodhpur. Other scholars point out that Aurangzeb also built many temples. Ian Copeland says that he built more temples than he destroyed. 
Ram Punayani states that Aurangzeb was not always fanatically anti-Hindu, but rather kept changing his policies depending on the needs of the situation. He banned the construction of new temples, but permitted the repair and maintenance of existing temples. He also made generous donations of jaggers to several temples to win the sympathies of his Hindu subjects. There are several firmans orders in his name, supporting temples and gurudwaras, including Mahakaleshwar Temple of Ujjain, Balaji Temple of Chitrakoot, Yumananda Temple of Guwahati and the Shatrunjaya Jain Temples. <laughs> <laughs> Execution of opponents The first prominent execution during the long reign of Aurangzeb started with that of his brother Prince Dara Shiko, who was accused of being influenced by Hinduism although some sources argue it was done for political reasons. Aurangzeb had his allied brother Prince Murad Bash held for murder, judged and then executed. Aurangzeb is accused of poisoning his imprisoned nephew Sulayman Shiko. In 1689, the second Maratha Chhatrapati king, Sambhaji was brutally executed by Aurangzeb. In a sham trial, he was found guilty of murder and violence, atrocities against the Muslims of Burhanpur and Bahadurpur in Berar by Marathas under his command. In 1675, the Sikh leader Guru Teg Bahadur was arrested on orders by Aurangzeb, found guilty of blasphemy by a Qadi's court, and executed. The 32nd Dai Al Mitlak absolute missionary of the Dawoodi Bora sect of Mastali Islam Siedna Kutubhan Kutubuddin was executed by Aurangzeb, then governor of Gujarat, for heresy. On 27 June Ahmadil Akir 1056 AH, 1648 AD, Ahmadabad, India. Expansion of the Mughal Empire Soon after seizing the throne, Aurangzeb began advancements against the unruly Sultan of Bijapur and during 1657, the Mughals are known to have used rockets during the siege of Bidar, against Sidi Maryan. Aurangzeb's forces discharged rockets and grenades while scaling the walls, and Sidi Maryan himself was mortally wounded after a rocket struck his large gunpowder depot. After 27 days of hard fighting, Bidar was captured by the Mughals. In 1663, during his visit to Ladakh, Aurangzeb established direct control over that part of the empire, and loyal subjects such as Deldan Namgal agreed to pledge tribute and loyalty. Deldan Namgal is also known to have constructed a grand mosque in Leh, which he dedicated to Mughal rule. In 1664, Aurangzeb appointed Shasta Khan Subadar governor of Bengal. Shasta Khan eliminated Portuguese and Arakanese pirates from the region, and in 1666 recaptured the port of Chittagong from the Arakanese king, Sanda Thudhama. Chittagong remained a key port throughout Mughal rule. In 1685, Aurangzeb dispatched his son, Muhammad Azam Shah, with a force of nearly 50,000 men to capture Bijapur fort and defeat Sikandar Adil Shah, the ruler of Bijapur, who refused to be a vassal. The Mughals could not make any advancements upon Bijapur fort, mainly because of the superior usage of cannon batteries on both sides. Outraged by the stalemate Aurangzeb himself arrived on 4 September 1686 and commanded the siege of Bijapur. After eight days of fighting, the Mughals were victorious, only one remaining ruler, Abul Hassan Qutb Shah the Qubishahi ruler of Golconda, refused to surrender. He and his servicemen fortified themselves at Golconda and fiercely protected the Kalor mine, which was then probably the world's most productive diamond mine, and an important economic asset. In 1687, Aurangzeb led his Grand Mughal army against the Deccan Qubishahi fortress during the siege of Golconda. The Qubishahis had constructed massive fortifications throughout successive generations on a granite hill over 400 feet high with an enormous 8-mile-long wall enclosing the city. The main gates of Golconda had the ability to repulse any war elephant attack. Although the Qutbashahis maintained the impregnability of their walls, at night Aurangzeb and his infantry erected complex scaffolding that allowed them to scale the high walls. During the eight-month siege the Mughals faced many hardships including the death of their experienced commander Kilich Khan Bahadur. Eventually, Aurangzeb and his forces managed to penetrate the walls by capturing a gate, and their entry into the fort led Abul Hassan Qutb Shah to surrender peacefully. Topic. Military equipment Mughal cannon-making skills advanced during the 17th century. 
One of the most impressive Mughal cannons is known as the Zafirbox, which is a very rare composite cannon, that required skills in both wrought iron forge welding and bronze casting technologies and the in-depth knowledge of the qualities of both metals. Aurangzeb military entourage consisted of 16 cannons including the Azdaha Piker which, was capable of firing a 33.5 kg ordnance and Fateh Rabar 20 feet long with Persian and Arabic inscriptions. The Ibrahim Rauza was also a famed cannon, which was well known for its multi-barrels. François Bernier, the personal physician to Aurangzeb, observed versatile Mughal gun carriages each drawn by two horses. Despite these innovations, most soldiers used bows and arrows, the quality of sword manufacture was so poor that they preferred to use ones imported from England, and the operation of the cannons was entrusted not to Mughals but to European gunners. Other weapons used during the period included rockets, cauldrons of boiling oil, muskets and manjaniks stone throwing catapults. Infantry who were later called sepoy and who specialized in siege and artillery emerged during the reign of Aurangzeb. Topic: <laughs> War Elephants. In 1703, the Mughal commander at Karamandal, Dod Khan Pandi spent 10,500 coins to purchase 30 to 50 war elephants from Ceylon. Art and culture Aurangzeb was known to be of a more austere nature than his predecessors. Being religious he encouraged Islamic calligraphy. His reign also saw the building of the Lahore Badshahi Mosque, and Bibi Ka Makbara in Aurangabad for his wife Rabia Ud Durrani. Calligraphy The Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb is known to have patronized works of Islamic calligraphy during his reign particularly Syed Ali Tabrizi. Architecture Unlike his father, Aurangzeb was not much interested in architecture. Aurangzeb constructed a small marble mosque known as the Modi Masjid Pearl Mosque in the Red Fort complex in Delhi. He ordered the construction of the Badshahi Mosque in Lahore. He also constructed a mosque on Benares. The mosque he constructed in Srinagar is still the largest in Kashmir. The structure of Bibi Ka Makbara in Aurangabad, which now is a historical monument was constructed by the sons of Aurangzeb in remembrance of their mother. The inspiration came from Taj Mahal as is quite visible from its architecture. <laughs> Textiles The textile industry in the Mughal Empire emerged very firmly during the reign of the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb and was particularly well noted by François Bernier, a French physician of the Mughal Emperor. François Bernier writes how karkanas, or workshops for the artisans, particularly in textiles flourished by employing hundreds of embroiderers, who were superintended by a master. He further writes how Artisans manufacture of silk, fine brocade, and other fine muslins, of which are made turbans, robes of gold flowers, and tunics worn by females, so delicately fine as to wear out in one night, and cost even more if they were well embroidered with fine needlework. He also explains the different techniques employed to produce such complicated textiles such as himru, whose name is Persian for brocade. Paithani, whose pattern is identical on both sides, mushroom, satin weave, and how kalamkari, in which fabrics are painted or block printed, was a technique that originally came from Persia. François Bernier provided some of the first, impressive descriptions of the designs and the soft, delicate texture of pashmina shawls also known as khani, which were very valued for their warmth and comfort among the Mughals, and how these textiles and shawls eventually began to find their way to France and England. Foreign relations As soon as he became emperor, Aurangzeb sent some of the finest ornate gifts such as carpets, lamps, tiles and others to the Islamic shrines at Mecca and Medina. He also ordered the construction of very large ships in Surat that would transport these gifts and even pilgrims to the Hiyas. These annual expeditions organized by Aurangzeb were led by Mir Aziz Badakhshi who died in Mecca of natural causes but managed to deliver more than 45,000 silver coins and several thousand caftans of honor. Topic: 
Topic: <laughs> Relations with the Uzbek. Subhan Kali, Balkh's Uzbek ruler was the first to recognize him in 1658 and requested for a general alliance. He worked alongside the new Mughal emperor since 1647, when Aurangzeb was the subadar of Balkh. Topic: <laughs> Relations with the Safavid dynasty. Aurangzeb received the embassy of Abbas II of Persia in 1660 and returned them with gifts. However, relations between the Mughal Empire and the Safavid dynasty were tense because the Persians attacked the Mughal army positioned near Kandahar. Aurangzeb prepared his armies in the Indus River basin for a counteroffensive, but Abbas II's death in 1666 caused Aurangzeb to end all hostilities. Aurangzeb's rebellious son, Sultan Muhammad Akbar, sought refuge with Suleiman I of Persia, who had rescued him from the Imam of Muscat and later refused to assist him in any military adventures against Aurangzeb. <laughs> Relations with the French In 1667, the French East India Company ambassadors Le Gouze and Bibert presented Louis XIV of France's letter which urged the protection of French merchants from various rebels in the Deccan. In response to the letter, Aurangzeb issued a firman allowing the French to open a factory in Surat. <laughs> Relations with the Sultanate of Maldives In the 1660s, the Sultan of the Maldives, Ibrahim Iskander I, requested help from Aurangzeb's representative, the Fawidar of Balasore. The Sultan was concerned about the impact of Dutch and English trading ships, but the powers of Aurangzeb did not extend to the seas. The Maldives were not under his governance, and nothing came of the request. Topic: <laughs> Relations with the Ottoman Empire. Like his father, Aurangzeb was not willing to acknowledge the Ottoman claim to the caliphate. He often supported the Ottoman Empire's enemies, extending cordial welcome to two rebel governors of Basra, and granting them and their families a high status in the imperial service. Sultan Suleiman II's friendly postures were ignored by Aurangzeb. The Sultan urged Aurangzeb to wage holy war against Christians. Relations with the English In 1686, the East India Company, which had unsuccessfully tried to obtain a firman imperial directive that would grant England regular trading privileges throughout the Mughal Empire, initiated the so-called Child's War. This hostility against the empire ended in disaster for the English, particularly in 1689 when Aurangzeb dispatched a strong fleet of grab ships from Hanhira that blockaded Bombay. The ships, commanded by Sidi Yaqob, were manned by Mapilla loyal to Ali Raja Ali II and Abyssinian sailors. In 1690, the company sent envoys to Aurangzeb's camp to plead for a pardon. The company's envoys had to prostrate themselves before the emperor, pay a large indemnity, and promise better behavior in the future. In September 1695, English pirate Henry Every perpetrated one of the most profitable pirate raids in history with his capture of a Grand Mughal Grab convoy near Surat. The Indian ships had been returning home from their annual pilgrimage to Mecca when the pirates struck, capturing the Ganj i Sawai, reportedly the greatest ship in the Muslim fleet, and its escorts in the process. When news of the piracy reached the mainland, a livid Aurangzeb nearly ordered an armed attack against the English-governed city of Bombay, though he finally agreed to compromise after the East India Company promised to pay financial reparations, estimated at £600,000 by the Mughal authorities. Meanwhile, Aurangzeb shut down four of the East India Company's factories, imprisoned the workers and captains who were nearly lynched by a rioting mob, and threatened to put an end to all English trading in India until every was captured. The Privy Council and East India Company offered a massive bounty for Every's apprehension, leading to the first worldwide manhunt in recorded history. However, Every successfully eluded capture. In 1702, Aurangzeb sent Dodd Khan Pani, the Mughal Empire's subhadar of the Carnatic region, to besiege and blockade Fort St. George for more than three months. The governor of the Fort Thomas Pitt was instructed by the East India Company to sue for peace. Topic. 
Administrative reforms Tribute Aurangzeb received tribute from all over the Indian subcontinent using the wealth which he received he established bases and fortifications in India particularly in the Carnatic, Deccan, Bengal and Lahore. Revenue Aurangzeb's exchequer raised a record £100 million in annual revenue through various sources like taxes, customs and land revenue, et al., from 24 provinces. He had an annual yearly revenue of $450 million, more than ten times that of his contemporary Louis XIV of France. Coins. <coughs> 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 Aurangzeb felt that verses from the Quran should not be stamped on coins, as done in former times, because they were constantly touched by the hands and feet of people. His coins had the name of the mint city and the year of issue on one face, and, the following couplet on other. King Aurangzeb Alamgir stamped coins, in the world, like the bright full moon. <inaudible> Rebellions. Traditional and newly coherent social groups in northern and western India, such as the Marathas, Rajputs, Hindu Jats, Pashtuns, and Sikhs, gained military and governing ambitions during Mughal rule, which, through collaboration or opposition, gave them both recognition and military experience. In 1669, the Hindu Jat peasants of Bharatpur around Mathura rebelled and created Bharatpur state but were defeated. In 1659, Shivaji, launched a surprise attack on the Mughal viceroy Shasta Khan and, while waging war against Aurangzeb. Shivaji and his forces attacked the Deccan, Hanhira and Surat and tried to gain control of vast territories. In 1689 Aurangzeb's armies captured Shivaji's son Sambhaji and executed him after he had sacked Burhanpur. But, the Marathas continued the fight and it actually started the terminal decline of his empire. In 1679, the Rathor clan under the command of Durgata's Rathor rebelled when Aurangzeb didn't give permission to make the young Rathor prince the king and took direct command of Jodhpur. This incident caused great unrest among the Hindu Rajput rulers under Aurangzeb and led to many rebellions in Rajputana. In 1672, the Satnami, a sect concentrated in an area near Delhi, under the leadership of Burbhan, took over the administration of Narnal, but they were eventually crushed upon Aurangzeb's personal intervention with very few escaping alive. In 1671, the Battle of Saraghat was fought in the easternmost regions of the Mughal Empire against the Ahom Kingdom. The Mughals led by Mir Jumla II and Shasta Khan attacked and were defeated by the Ahams. Maharaja Chhatrasal was a medieval Indian warrior from Bundela Rajput clan, who fought against the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb, and established his own kingdom in Bundelkhand, becoming a Maharaja of Panna. <laughs> Jat Rebellion In 1669, Hindu Jats began to organize a rebellion that is believed to have been caused by Aurangzeb's imposition of jizya a form of organized religious taxation. The Jats were led by Gokula, a rebel landholder from Tilpat. By the year 1670 20,000 Jat rebels were quelled and the Mughal army took control of Tilpat. Gokula's personal fortune amounted to 93,000 gold coins and hundreds of thousands of silver coins. Gokula was caught and executed. But the Jats continued to terrorize the Mughals. Raja Ram Jat, in order to avenge his father Gokula's death, plundered Akbar's tomb of its gold, silver and fine carpets, opened Akbar's grave and dragged his bones and burned them in retaliation. Jats also shot off the tops of the minarets on the gateway to Akbar's tomb and melted down two silver doors from the Taj Mahal. Aurangzeb appointed Muhammad Bidar Bakht as commander to crush the rebellion. On 4 July 1688, Raja Ram Jat was fatally shot. His head was sent to Aurangzeb as proof, however, after Aurangzeb's death Jats under Badan Singh later established their independent state of Bharatpur. Mughal-Maratha Wars 
In 1657, while Aurangzeb attacked Golconda and Bijapur in the Deccan, the Hindu Maratha warrior, Shivaji, used guerrilla tactics to take control of three Adil Shahi forts formerly under his father's command. With these victories, Shivaji assumed de facto leadership of many independent Maratha clans. The Marathas harried the flanks of the warring Adil Shahis and Mughals, gaining weapons, forts, and territory. Shivaji's small and ill-equipped army survived an all-out Adil Shahi attack, and Shivaji personally killed the Adil Shahi general, Afzal Khan. With this event, the Marathas transformed into a powerful military force, capturing more and more Adil Shahi and Mughal territories. Shivaji went on to neutralize Mughal power in the region. In 1659, Aurangzeb sent his trusted general and maternal uncle Shasta Khan, the Wali in Golconda, to recover forts lost to the Maratha rebels. Shasta Khan drove into Maratha territory and took up residence in Pune. But in a daring raid on the governor's palace in Pune during a midnight wedding celebration, led by Shivaji himself, the Marathas killed Shasta Khan's son and Shivaji maimed Shasta Khan by cutting off three fingers of his hand. Shasta Khan, however, survived and was reappointed the administrator of Bengal going on to become a key commander in the war against the Ahams. Shivaji captured forts belonging to both Mughals and Bijapur. At last Aurangzeb ordered the armament of the Dalatabad fort with two bombards the Dalatabad fort was later used as a Mughal bastion during the Deccan Wars. Aurangzeb also sent his general Raja Jai Singh of Amber, a Hindu Rajput, to attack the Marathas. Jai Singh won the fort of Parandar after fierce battle in which the Maratha commander Murarbaji fell. Foreseeing defeat, Shivaji agreed for a truce and a meeting with Aurangzeb at Delhi. Jai Singh also promised Shivaji his safety, placing him under the care of his own son, the future Raja Ram Singh I. However, circumstances at the Mughal court were beyond the control of the Raja, and when Shivaji and his son Sambhaji went to Agra to meet Aurangzeb, they were placed under house arrest, from which they managed to effect a daring escape. Shivaji returned to the Deccan, and crowned himself Chhatrapati or the ruler of the Maratha kingdom in 1674. While Aurangzeb continued to send troops against him, Shivaji expanded Maratha control throughout the Deccan until his death in 1680. Shivaji was succeeded by his son, Sambhaji. Militarily and politically, Mughal efforts to control the Deccan continued to fail. On the other hand, Aurangzeb's third son Akbar left the Mughal court along with a few Muslim Manzabdar supporters and joined Muslim rebels in the Deccan. Aurangzeb, in response, moved his court to Aurangabad and took over command of the Deccan campaign. The rebels were defeated and Akbar fled south to seek refuge with Sambhaji, Shivaji's successor. More battles ensued, and Akbar fled to Persia and never returned. In 1689, Aurangzeb's forces captured and executed Sambhaji. His successor Rajaram, later Rajaram's widow Tarabai and their Maratha forces fought individual battles against the forces of the Mughal Empire. Territory changed hands repeatedly during the years 1689 to of interminable warfare. As there was no central authority among the Marathas, Aurangzeb was forced to contest every inch of territory, at great cost in lives and money. Even as Aurangzeb drove west, deep into Maratha territory, notably conquering Satara, the Marathas expanded their attacks further into Mughal lands, Malwa, Hyderabad and Jinji in Tamil Nadu. Aurangzeb waged continuous war in the Deccan for more than two decades with no resolution. He thus lost about a fifth of his army fighting rebellions led by the Marathas in Deccan India. He travelled a long distance to the Deccan to conquer the Marathas and eventually died at the age of 88, still fighting the Marathas. Aurangzeb's shift from conventional warfare to anti insurgency in the Deccan region shifted the paradigm of Mughal military thought. There were conflicts between Marathas and Mughals in Pune, Jinji, Malwa and Vadodara. The Mughal Empire's port city of Surat was sacked twice by the Marathas during the reign of Aurangzeb and the valuable port was in ruins. Matthew White estimates that about 2.5 million of Aurangzeb's army were killed during the Mughal Maratha Wars, 100,000 annually during a quarter century, while 2 million civilians in war-torn lands died due to drought, plague and famine. AHOM campaign While Aurangzeb and his brother Shah Shuja had been fighting against each other, the Hindu rulers of Kutch Behar and Assam took advantage of the disturbed conditions in the Mughal Empire, had invaded imperial dominions. 
For three years they were not attacked, but in 1660 Mir Jumla II, the Viceroy of Bengal, was ordered to recover the lost territories. The Mughals set out in November 1661. Within weeks they occupied the capital of Kutch Behar, which they annexed. Leaving a detachment to garrison it, the Mughal army began to retake their territories in Assam. Mir Jumla II advanced on Gargan, the capital of the Ahom Kingdom, and reached it on 17 March 1662. The ruler, Raja Sutamla, had fled before his approach. The Mughals captured 82 elephants, 300,000 rupees in cash, 1,000 ships, and 173 stores of rice. On his way back to Dhaka, in March 1663, Mir Jumla II died of natural causes. Skirmishes continued between the Mughals and Ahams after the rise of Chakradwaj Singha, who refused to pay further indemnity to the Mughals and during the wars that continued the Mughals suffered great hardships. Munawar Khan emerged as a leading figure and is known to have supplied food to vulnerable Mughal forces in the region near Mathurapur. Although the Mughals under the command of Syed Firas Khan the Fawadar at Guwahati were overrun by two Ahom armies in 1667, but they continued to hold and maintain presence in their eastern territories even after the Battle of Saraghat in 1671. The Battle of Saraghat was fought in 1671 between the Mughal Empire led by the Kachwaha king, Raja Ramsingh I, and the Ahom kingdom led by Lachit Borfukan on the Brahmaputra River at Saraghat, now in Guwahati. Although much weaker, the Ahom army defeated the Mughal army by brilliant uses of the terrain, clever diplomatic negotiations to buy time, guerrilla tactics, psychological warfare, military intelligence and by exploiting the sole weakness of the Mughal forces—its navy. The Battle of Saraghat was the last battle in the last major attempt by the Mughals to extend their empire into Assam. Though the Mughals managed to regain Guwahati briefly after a later Borfukan deserted it, the Ahams wrested control in the Battle of Itakuli in 1682 and maintained it till the end of their rule. <laughs> Satnami opposition In May 1672, the Satnami sect obeying the commandments of an old toothless woman according to Mughal accounts organized a massive revolt in the agricultural heartlands of the Mughal Empire. The Satnamis were known to have shaved off their heads and even eyebrows and had temples in many regions of northern India. They began a large-scale rebellion 75 miles southwest of Delhi. The Satnamis believed they were invulnerable to Mughal bullets and believed they could multiply in any region they entered. The Satnamis initiated their march upon Delhi and overran small scale Mughal infantry units. Aurangzeb responded by organizing a Mughal army of 10,000 troops and artillery, and dispatched detachments of his own personal Mughal Imperial Guards to carry out several tasks. To boost Mughal morale, Aurangzeb wrote Islamic prayers, made amulets, and drew designs that would become emblems in the Mughal army. This rebellion would have a serious aftermath effect on the Punjab. Sikh opposition Early in Aurangzeb's reign, various insurgent groups of Sikhs engaged Mughal troops in increasingly bloody battles. The ninth Sikh guru, Guru Teg Bahadur, like his predecessors was opposed to conversion of the local population as he considered it wrong. According to Sikh sources, approached by Kashmiri Pandits to help them retain their faith and avoid forced religious conversions, Guru Teg Bahadur took on Aurangzeb. The emperor perceived the rising popularity of the guru as a threat to his sovereignty and in 1670 had him executed, which infuriated the Sikhs. In response, Guru Teg Bahadur's son and successor, Guru Gobind Singh, further militarized his followers, starting with the establishment of Khalsa in 1699, eight years before Aurangzeb's death. In 1705, Guru Gobind Singh sent a letter entitled Zafranama to Aurangzeb. This drew attention to Aurangzeb's cruelty and how he had betrayed Islam. The letter caused him much distress and remorse. Guru Gobind Singh's formation of Khalsa in 1699 led to the establishment of the Sikh Confederacy and later Sikh Empire. <laughs> Sikh Mughal Wars Battle of Bongani Battle of Nadan Battle of Gular 1696 Battle of Anandpur 1700 Battle of Anandpur 1701 
Battle of Nirmogar 1702 Battle of Basoli First Battle of Chamkor 1702 First Battle of Anandpur 1704 Second Battle of Anandpur Battle of Sarsa Battle of Chamkor 1704 Battle of Muktsar was the last battle fought between Guru Gobind Singh and the Mughals Topic Pashtun opposition The Pashtun revolt in 1672 under the leadership of the warrior poet Kushal Khan Khadak of Kabul, was triggered when soldiers under the orders of the Mughal governor Amir Khan allegedly molested women of the Pashtun tribes in modern-day Kuna province of Afghanistan. The Safi tribes retaliated against the soldiers. This attack provoked a reprisal, which triggered a general revolt of most of tribes. Attempting to reassert his authority, Amir Khan led a large Mughal army to the Khyber Pass, where the army was surrounded by tribesmen and routed, with only four men, including the governor, managing to escape. Aurangzeb's incursions into the Pashtun areas were described by Kushal Khan Khadak as, "...black is the Mughal's heart towards all of us Pathans." Aurangzeb employed the scorched earth policy, sending soldiers who massacred, looted and burnt many villages. Aurangzeb also proceeded to use bribery to turn the Pashtun tribes against each other, with the aim that they would distract a unified Pashtun challenge to Mughal authority, and the impact of this was to leave a lasting legacy of mistrust among the tribes. After that, the revolt spread, with the Mughals suffering a near total collapse of their authority in the Pashtun belt. The closure of the important Atak Kabul trade route along the Grand Trunk Road was particularly disastrous. By 1674, the situation had deteriorated to a point where Aurangzeb camped at Atak to personally take charge. Switching to diplomacy and bribery along with force of arms, the Mughals eventually split the rebels and partially suppressed the revolt, although they never managed to wield effective authority outside the main trade route. <laughs> Death By 1689, almost all of southern India was a part of the Mughal Empire and after the conquest of Golconda, Mughal victories in the south expanded the Mughal Empire to 4 million square kilometres, with a population estimated to be over 158 million. But this supremacy was short-lived. Yosh Gamans, professor of colonial and global history at the University of Leiden, says that the high point of imperial centralization under Emperor Aurangzeb coincided with the start of the imperial downfall. Unlike his predecessors, Aurangzeb considered the royal treasury to be held in trust for the citizens of his empire. He made caps and copied the Quran to earn money for his use. Aurangzeb constructed a small marble mosque known as the Modi Masjid Pearl Mosque in the Red Fort complex in Delhi. However, his constant warfare, especially with the Marathas, drove his empire to the brink of bankruptcy just as much as the wasteful personal spending and opulence of his predecessors. The Indologist Stanley Wolpert, emeritus professor at UCLA, says that The conquest of the Deccan, to which Aurangzeb devoted the last 26 years of his life, was in many ways a Pyrrhic victory, costing an estimated 100,000 lives a year during its last decade of feudal chess game warfare. The expense in gold and rupees can hardly be accurately estimated. Aurangzeb's encampment was like a moving capital, a city of tents 30 miles in circumference, with some 250 bazaars, with a one-half million camp followers, 50,000 camels and 30,000 elephants, all of whom had to be fed, stripped the Deccan of any and all of its surplus grain and wealth. Not only famine but bubonic plague arose. Even Aurangzeb, had ceased to understand the purpose of it all by the time he was nearing ninety. I came alone and I go as a stranger. I do not know who I am, nor what I have been doing." The dying old man confessed to his son, Azam, in February 1707. Even when ill and dying, Aurangzeb made sure that the populace knew he was still alive, for if they had thought otherwise then the turmoil of another war of succession was likely. He died at his military camp in Bingar near Ahmednagar on 20 February 1707 at the age of 89, having outlived many of his children. His modest open-air grave in Kudabad expresses his deep devotion to his Islamic beliefs. It is cited in the courtyard of the shrine of the Sufi saint Sheikh Burhan ud-Din Garib, who was a disciple of Nizamuddin Aliya of Delhi. 
Many Indian historians consider his death year 1707 as the one which marks the end of medieval Indian history and the start of modern Indian history when classifying Indian history. This is because of the start of decline of the Mughal Empire and the start of domination of European powers in India. Brown writes that after his death, a string of weak emperors, wars of succession, and coups by noblemen heralded the irrevocable weakening of Mughal power. She notes that the populist but fairly old-fashioned explanation for the decline is that there was a reaction to Aurangzeb's oppression. Aurangzeb's son, Bahadur Shah I, succeeded him and the empire, both because of Aurangzeb's overextension and because of Bahadur Shah's weak military and leadership qualities, entered a period of terminal decline. Immediately after Bahadur Shah occupied the throne, the Maratha Empire, which Aurangzeb had held at bay, inflicting high human and monetary costs even on his own empire, consolidated and launched effective invasions of Mughal territory, seizing power from the weak emperor. Within decades of Aurangzeb's death, the Mughal emperor had little power beyond the walls of Delhi. Aurangzeb's religious zeal exacted a heavy price both to himself and his nation. Will Durant states, his deathbed letters are pitiful documents. I know not who I am, where I shall go, or what will happen to this sinner full of sins. My years have gone by profitless. God has been in my heart, yet my darkened eyes have not recognized his light. There is no hope for me in the future. The fever is gone, but only the skin is left. I have greatly sinned, and know not what torments await me. May the peace of God be upon you. He left instructions that his funeral should be ascetically simple, and that no money should be spent on his shroud except the four rupees that he had made by sewing caps. The top of his coffin was to be covered with a plain piece of canvas. To the poor he left 300 rupees earned by copying the Quran. He died at the age of 89, having long outstayed his welcome on the earth. Within 17 years of his death his empire was broken into fragments. The support of the people, so wisely won by Akbar, had been forfeited by the cruelty of Jahangir, the wastefulness of Jahan, and the intolerance of Aurangzeb. The Muslim minority, already enervated by India's heat, had lost the military ardor and physical vigor of their prime, and no fresh recruits were coming from the north to buttress their declining power. Meanwhile, far away in the west, a little island had sent its traders to cull the riches of India. Soon it would send its guns, and take over this immense empire in which Hindu and Muslim had joined to build one of the great civilizations of history. During British rule of India, a road in Delhi was named Aurangzeb Road. In November 2014, it was renamed to Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Road. Criticism <inaudible> 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 His critics argue that his ruthless and vindictive religious bigotry made him unsuitable to rule the mixed population of his empire and policies of persecution of Shias, Sufis and non-Muslims to impose practices of orthodox Islamic state, such as imposition of sharia and jizya religious tax on non-Muslims, doubling of custom duties on Hindus while abolishing it for Muslims, executions of Muslims and non-Muslims, destruction of temples, forbidding construction and repairs of some temples, which they argue led to numerous rebellions. G. N. Moin Shakir and Sarma Festschrift argue that he often used political opposition as pretext for religious persecution, and that, as a result, Jats, Marathas, Sikhs, Satnamis and Pashtuns all rose against him. <laughs> <laughs> Full title Aurangzeb's full imperial title was Al Sultan al Azam wal Khakan al Makaram Hazrat Abul Muzaffar Mui ud Din Muhammad Aurangzeb Bahadur Alamgir I Badshah Ghazi Shahanshah e Sultanat ul Hindia wal Mughalia In literature Aurangzeb has prominently featured in the following books. 1675 Aurangzeb, play by John Dryden, written and featured on the London stage during the Emperor's lifetime. 19, Hindi fiction novel by Acharya Chatursan Shastri 1970 Shahenshah Sahanasaha the Marathi fictional biography by N. S. Inamdar 2017 Shahenshah, The Life of Aurangzeb, the English translation by Vikrant Pand of the 1970 Marathi fictional biography by N. S. Inamdar
Topic: Ancestry. Topic: See also. Jagar Fort. Mughal weapons. List of largest empires. Muhammad Azam. Gujarat under Aurangzeb. <laughs>